Hi, thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to be going over problem 3, part 2 from week 7 of the Invariant Summit Puzzle Competition. As always, I'll leave a link in the description below to the Facebook page of the Invariants where you can find more details of the competition. As I say, this is part 2 of problem 3. I've already made a video for part 1, so if you've not seen that before, I'll leave a link for that in the description below as well. But anyway, this is the problem I'm going to be covering in this video. We have the sets SK to be uh, this guy here, so it's the set of K tuples, so vectors of length K where each uh, entry is a positive integer and it has the property that, well, if we write it as a1, a2 and so on all the way up to ak, then we must have that a1 is less than or equal to a2 is less than or equal to and so on all the way up to ak, so they're kind of non-decreasing. And it also must have this property here that if we do all of the ai's multiplied together, so all of the aj, sorry, multiplied together and then add on ai and then divide through by ai squared, we're always going to have to get a positive integer regardless of what i is. So in other words, if we do the product of them and then add on any element and then divide through by that element squared, uh, we must always get uh, a positive integer. We want to prove that the cardinality of sk is bigger than or equal to k plus 1. And then once we've done that, we want to find a lower bound which is better than linear. So in this case, we did find a lower bound. Uh, you know, once we've done this, we will have found a lower bound for sk but obviously our lower bound is just k plus 1 which is linear in k. We want to find one which is better than linear. Okay, so if you want to have a go at this problem, pause the video now and give it a go for yourself, and I'm going to jump straight into a solution. Okay, so we're going to use induction to prove that sk is at least k plus 1, or the cardinality of sk is at least k plus 1. So let's just look at the base case where k equals 1, then what we want to do is show that s1 is bigger than or equal to 2, sorry, the cardinality of s1 is bigger than or equal to 2, or we can just go ahead and write down what s1 is. Just by definition, S1 is a set of, you know, one tuples, which is just a set of positive integers A, for which, you know, we don't need to worry about our non-decreasing condition because there's only one element, but we do need to have that A plus A divided by A squared is a positive integer. So A is just the product of all our entries, but there's only one entry, so that's just A. Then plus uh, our only entry, which is A divided by A squared, be a natural number. So in other words, we need 2A over A squared, to be a natural number, but because a is a natural number in particular, it's non-zero, so I can divide the top and bottom by a, so I get 2 over a is a natural number, which implies that a must be 1 or 2, so then we can just uh, deduce that s1 is that set there with 1 and 2 in it, or if we want to be technical, they'd be vectors, but it doesn't really matter, it's got two elements in, so that means that the cardinality of s1 is just 2, so certainly the cardinality of s1 is greater than or equal to 2. So that proves our base case pretty straightforward. Now let's continue to the inductive step. Okay, so now we're going to assume that the cardinality of sk minus 1 is at least k, and from that we want to then prove that the cardinality of sk is bigger than or equal to k plus 1, and once we've done that, we'll be done by induction. Okay, so what we want to do is, in order, to, in order to prove this is bigger than or equal to k plus 1, of course we want to use our assumption, and what we want to do is show that there's, uh, you know, for every element in this guy here, we can generate a guy in, uh, one in this guy here. And the way we're going to do that is let uh, a1, a2, all the way up to ak minus 1, let that be an sk minus 1. Okay, then what do we know? Well, then we know that a1 is less than or equal to a2 is less than or equal to ak minus 1. So they're increasing, like so. But we also have the kind of product property that tells us that if you multiply them all together, so the product of all of them, uh, j1 to k minus 1 of a j plus a i divided by a i squared, that guy there is always going to be a positive integer, which is great. But then what we want to do is from this generate uh, one that's in sk. But notice that if I just consider this guy here, 1, a1, a2, all the way up to a k minus 1, then this is clearly a k duple where all entries are positive integers. It certainly is non-decreasing because we know a1 is going to be at least 1 because it's a positive integer. So we know that 1 is less than or equal to a1. And then we know a1 is less than or equal to a2 from this guy here. And a2 is less than or equal to a3 from this guy here. And so on. So it's non-decreasing. The only thing we need to check is that it satisfies this property here. So if I call this guy here, just to avoid any ambiguity, b1, b2, all the way up to bk like so. And I need to check that this property here holds. So let's check it holds for b1. So we need to check that the product from j equals 1 to k of bj plus bi, or b1, sorry, divided by b1 squared 
is an integer, but this is very certainly going to be true because b1 is just 1, so b1 squared is just 1, so we're doing an, an integer divided by 1, so of course that's going to be true. The next thing we need to do is just ch check for all the other uh, bj, so uh, bi, sorry, so if we do, do the product of all the bj, so bj, j, j equals 1 to k of bj plus bi divided by bi squared, and now this bi is one of these guys here, so i equals 2 up to k. Well, notice that this guy here from j equals 1 to k, the product of the bj's, the first term is 1, so we can kind of ignore that in our multiplication. And then all the other terms are just these ai's here. So it's what we have up here. So this thing here is just the same thing as the product from j equals 1 to k minus 1 of aj. And because we're considering i from 2 to k, that means bi just corresponds to one of the ai's from uh, 1 to k minus 1. So bi is just ai minus 1. And then bi squared is just ai minus 1 squared, like so. But we know that this is an integer from this guy here. So that means that this is a valid tuple, i.e. this guy here is going to be an s. So essentially, for every element we have in sk minus 1, we can generate a corresponding one in sk by just putting a 1 in front. And we've just showed that it satisfies all the properties for it to be in sk. So that tells us that the cardinality of sk oopsie daisy, is bigger than or equal to the cardinality of sk minus 1, which we know is bigger than or equal to k. So we have the cardinality of sk is bigger than or equal to k. But notice that that's not good enough, because we want to show that the cardinality of sk is bigger than or equal to k plus 1. So we've got to show that there's still one other, or at least one other element in the set. But of course, I've run out of room here, so let me clean up the whiteboard, and we'll move on to that. Okay, so we need to find another element in sk, and we're going to kind of do a similar trick, where we take an element in sk minus 1 and generate a new one. And then once we've generated this new one and shown that it's distinct from, uh, you know, the ones that we just produced, then that will prove that the cardinality of sk is at least k plus 1, and that will solve the first part, and then we'll move on to finding a better than linear lower bound. Anyway, let's take an element in sk minus 1, and I'm going to show you another way to generate um, an element in sk. What we're going to do is take the exact same thing, so a1, a2, and so on, all the way up to ak minus 1. So the first k minus 1 elements are the same. And then to get the final one, what we're going to do is multiply all of these together and then add 1. So a1, a2, so on, all the way up to ak minus 1, and then add 1. Now this, uh, this is certainly a k tuple because it's got k minus 1 elements there and then the final element there. So it's a k tuple and it's very clear to see that it's also non decreasing because we know these guys are going to be non decreasing from this guy here because this is in sk minus 1. Hence, a1 must be less than or equal to a2, must be less than or equal to so on, all the way up to ak minus 1. So this is less than or equal to that, that's less than or equal to that, and so on. That is less than or equal to that. And it's very clear to see that this thing here is less than this thing, because we know each of the ai's are positive integers, so we've got a bunch of positive integers multiplied by ak minus 1. So this guy here is going to be at least ak minus 1, and then we're adding on 1, so it's going to be bigger than ak minus 1. So it's certainly non-decreasing there. The only thing we need to check is like the product property. So again, just to make things clear, let's call this thing here b1, b2, and so on, all the way up to bk minus 1, and then this final term will be bk, like so. And we need to check that the product of the bj's plus bi divided by bi squared is always an integer regardless of what i is. And now just for clarity, what I'm going to do is define p to be equal to the product of the ai, so from i equals 1 to k minus 1 of ai, like so. So that tells us that bk is simply p plus 1, because p is just the product of the ai's, and then adding on 1. So I can write bk is just p plus 1, like so. Now let's check the property that, uh, you know, when I do the product of the bi's, which is gonna, just going to be b1 times b2 times so on, all the way up to bk minus 1 times bk. But notice that b2 b1 times b2 and so on with bk minus 1, well b1 is just a1, b2 is just a2, and all the way up to bk minus 1 is just ak minus 1. So this is just the product of the ai, so it's just p. So the product of the bi's is just p times bk, and bk we know is p plus 1. So we know that the product from j equals 1 to k of bj, that is just p times p plus 1. So what we need to do is check that p times p plus 1 uh, plus bi divided by bi squared, we need to check that guy there is an integer for all i. Well, let's just check it for i equals k first, so our final term. So when i equals k, um, we've got bk there, which is just p plus 1. 
So let's put it there. And then bi squared is just going to be p plus one, uh, bk squared, sorry, is going to be p plus one squared. And notice that we've got a p plus one uh, on the top, so, and we can cancel that with the one on the bottom, so that it gets rid of this and gets rid of this and just puts a one there. And we've got p plus one divided by p plus one, and of course that's one, which is certainly a positive integer. So that does the case where uh, i equals k. Now let's move on to the case where i is less than k, so we've got something like this. But then we know that bi is just ai, so we can get rid of this and put ai, get rid of this and put ai squared. But we know from the fact that this is an sk, we know that p plus ai divided by ai squared, that thing there is a positive integer. So we kind of have that this thing here is a positive integer, or we have, you know, we want to use this to be able to show that this is a positive integer. So let's just expand the p squared, uh, p plus, times p plus 1, which is obviously going to give us a p squared plus p plus ai, and I'm going to write it like this, like so. Now we know that p plus ai divided by ai squared is an integer, so that guy there is an integer. So just to show that this whole thing is an integer, it's equivalent to showing that this thing here is an integer, p squared over ai squared. But remember what p, p is, p is just the product of all the ais. So certain, or all the aj's, perhaps I should write here. So in particular, when the case where, when we're looking at this product here, where j equals i, we're gonna have an ai in that product. And then of course we're squaring it. So we're gonna have an ai squared in our numerator, and it's gonna cancel with the ai squared in our denominator. And what we'll be left with is just a numerator, which is essentially the product of all the other aj's squared. So certainly that's gonna be a positive integer. So a positive integer plus a positive integer, this guy certainly is a positive integer. So that tells us that this guy here is also a valid element in SK. So take any element in SK minus one and then kind of write it out the same and then do the product of all of the terms and then add one to get your final term. That guy there is gonna be an SK. However, we just need to check that this thing we've written down isn't the same as one of the ones we had before when I put one in front, okay? And one way we can do that or ensure that we get a different one is look at all the elements in sk minus 1 and take the one that has the biggest ak minus 1. So sk minus 1 is finite and we actually know that from part 1 of the problem which I made in this different video. sk minus 1 is finite so we can write it down and then choose the one which has biggest ak minus 1, so biggest last term, and then do this process on that. And then we know that this final term here, because ak minus 1 is as big as possible, we know this thing here is going to be bigger than that guy there and from what we had before when we would just put one in front of all these terms so to get from this you know the k terms I had before or at least k terms I had before that just came from taking this and putting a one in front so I haven't actually changed my last like number my last number will still be the same so if I take the one with the biggest ak minus one value then I do this thing here I know that this guy here is going to be different to if I put a one in front of this so hopefully that makes sense. Let me perhaps give an example. If sk minus 1 was, say, say we're working with k minus 1 is 2. Okay, this is probably not right, but suppose it was something like this. Okay, then essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking the one with the biggest, largest, uh, biggest second value. So that would be this guy here, because 3 is the three is bigger than 1 and 3 is bigger than 2. And as I say, these are probably not the ones that go into sk minus 1, but this is just for illustration purposes. Then what I'm going to do is take this guy here, one, three, and then my last element, I'm gonna do this process on. So I'm gonna do the product of the term, so that's one times three, then add one, so that's gonna be four. And I know that this guy is gonna be different to the ones I get when I take this set and put the ones in front. So one, one, two, one, 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 and then one, one, three. I know it's gonna be different to all of those because the last term here is strictly bigger than all those terms there. So I've generated another one, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. So I hope that's made sense. I hope, uh, you know, essentially what we're doing is we need to prove that this one here we get, we can generate one via this, which is different to the ones that we just proved by just shoving a one in front. And the way we can do that, one way we can do that is by taking a look at the one with the biggest ak minus one value. And we know that this thing here is gonna be strictly bigger than ak minus one because we're adding one. So then it's gonna be strictly bigger than the ones we generate by putting a one in front. Anyway, I hope that has made sense. And that kind of solves the main part of this problem to prove that sk is bounded below by k plus one by induction 
Now let's move on to, uh, I guess, a little bit more interesting is proving that SK actually has a better lower bound or better than linear lower bound. Anyway, let me clear up the whiteboard and we'll continue. Okay, so you may ask yourself, why did we even bother showing that SK has a linear lower bound when the next part is to prove that SK has a better than linear lower bound? And of course, if we can prove that SK has a better than linear lower bound, then certainly it grows at least linearly. So that would kind of prove that SK is at least, you know, K plus one with perhaps a few modifications for some small cases. But the reason we did do the first part is because we actually discovered a few tricks uh, in generating elements in SK by looking at elements in SK minus one. So one thing we did is we took an element SK minus one and then just shoved a one into its first element and shifted all the others across. And that gave us a valid element in SK. And then the other trick was you take an element in SK minus one and then you essentially write it down again. And then to get your final term, you do the product of the first K minus one terms and then add one. And both those times we showed that that's a valid element in SK and that proved that the cardinality of SK was at least K plus one. But now, you know, if we were a bit more careful with those two tricks, we can actually make that lower bound a bit better. And that's what we're going to do now. So firstly, let's define AK to be the set of, a set of, you know, K tuples in SK, which have the first element not equal to one. So a lot of them will have the first element equal to one. We're only considering the ones which do have a, a first element, you know, strictly bigger than one. Okay, then notice, or I claim that SK if I take out all the elements in AK and do the cardinality of that guy there, I claim that that guy there is equal to SK minus one, like so. And to see that this is true, well, notice that <coughs> SK without AK is simply the elements in SK which have first element one, because of course AK is the ones in SK which don't have first element one. Um, so SK without AK is simply the set of elements with first, simply the set of K tuples with first entry one. But then if I just get rid of the one, it's easy to check that that is going to be uh, an element in SK minus one. And similarly, we showed that if we take an element in SK minus one and just shove a one in it, we're going to get something in this set here. So these sets are essentially the same. But, you know, if you take away the one from the first element from this guy here, you're going to get the same set and hence their cardinalities must be the same. But then we can use this to deduce that the cardinality of SK is simply equal to SK minus one plus the cardinality of AK. Okay, so essentially by rearranging this, noting that SK without AK and AK are disjoint sets. So SK, the cardinality of SK is the cardinality of this guy here plus the cardinality of AK, but the cardinality of this guy here is just SK minus one. So we get this relation here. But then we can kind of do some telescoping to get a, a relationship, uh, kind of get a bound on SK by getting bounds on AK. So we notice that SK is simply equal to the sum from I equals two to K of SK, oh sorry, SI minus SI minus one, like so, and then just plus S1. And we know S1 is just two. We computed that in the first part. So that's just two, okay? So SK is equal to this guy here. So the sum from I equals two to K of SI minus SI minus one plus two. And to see this, just notice that it's telescoping. Um, so we just have to keep our, the addition of our top term, which is SK, that guy there, and then subtract off the i equals two case, which is the bottom one. So the si minus one would just, just be s1. And then of course we've got to add on s1 because we've got a minus one there. And then that's gonna give us plus two because cardinality of s1, s1 had just two elements in, namely one and two. So sk is equal to this guy here, but this thing here, si minus si minus one from this guy here, that is just ai, like so. And then just bring this plus two over here. So we have this equation here. So if we can find a lower bound on the AIs, then we can find a lower bound on SK, and then it will turn out that this lower bound here will be linear in uh, uh, I. So we're essentially adding up uh, some constant times I times I plus one, so, sorry, sorry, times one plus two plus three plus some lot to K, and we know that that is K times K minus one over two. So this guy here is gonna turn out to be, a, or we're gonna find a quadratic lower bound to SK by finding a linear lower bound to A. To, to the AI, sorry. Anyway, let me clean up the whiteboard and we'll do that. Okay, so I've written down what we just proved that the cardinality of SK is equal to the sum from I equals two to K of the cardinality of AI plus two. And now what we wanna do is, as I said, is to find a lower bound on the cardinality of AI. And what we're gonna do is a very similar technique to what we did kind of just before, where we showed that the cardinality of SK must be at least the cardinality of SK minus one plus one. So we showed that, you know, 
SK was at least SK minus one first, and then we kind of generated another element. So we're going to do a very similar thing. So firstly, I'm going to prove, or I, let me write down my claim, and then I'll prove it. I claim that AI is increasing. So in other words, AI plus one is bigger than or equal to AI. And we're going to, to prove this, we're going to do, use a very similar thing to how we proved that SK was bigger than or equal to SK minus one. Well, just notice that AI, the carnality of AI plus one being bigger than or equal to AI, we can use a very similar technique. So proof, so take an element in AI, so let A1, A2, and so on, all the way up to AK be in AI. Then we're going to get the A1 all the way up to AK times A1, A2, all the way up to AK plus 1. I claim that this guy here is in AI plus 1. Okay, oh, maybe I should put I's here as opposed to K's. A1, A2, all the way up to AI. So, if we take an element in AI, I claim that this new element here is in, a in AI plus 1. And once I can prove that, that will solve our problem because obviously then that means that for any element in AI, I can produce a new element in AI plus 1. So the cardinality of this guy here must be at least the cardinality of that guy there, which proves my claim. But to prove that this is true, well, firstly, notice that this guy here is certainly in SI plus 1 by the argument we had earlier where, you, you know, you just take an element from AI write it down to so the first i element, and then to get the next, the final element, you just do the product of these guys and add one. So we know that it's certainly in SI, uh, sorry, SI plus one. And to make sure that it's in AI plus one, we just need to check the first element is not one, but that's certainly true because it's A1, and we know A1's not one because this guy here is in AI. So the first element can't be one. So we get that this guy here is in AI plus one, and that proves our claim pretty quickly. So certainly we have that the cardinality of AI plus one is at least AI. The next thing we need to do is generate an element which is not of this form in AI plus one, and that will kind of prove that uh, this thing here is at least this thing plus one. But it's a little bit more difficult because we're not actually going to prove it's holds true for all i, we're going to show it holds true for just some subset of the i's. Okay, so we just showed that AI plus one has cardinality, at least the cardinality of AI, and that holds true for all i. The next thing we want to do is kind of consider the sequence of numbers, uh, the sequence of xi's, where x1 is given by 2, and then the r plus 1th term is just the product of all the xi's up to r plus 1. So this is just a sequence of positive integers. And then, you know, by induction, it's very easy to see that x1, x2, and so on, all the way up to xr, this guy here is going to be an ar for all r. And I guess one way to see that is notice, well, when r equals 1, we just have 2 being an a1. And that's certainly true because we know that 2 is an S1. And of course, 2 is not equal to 1. So the first term in this entry here, there's only one term, is not 1. So it's certainly going to be an A as well. So 2 is an A1. And then we know that when we take, you know, 1 and SK minus 1, multiply all the terms together and add 1 and put that as our final element, that's going to give us another term. So this kind of holds just by induction. So we know that this term here, X1, X2, all the way up to XR, is in AR. Okay, so now I make the claim that xr squared is congruent to minus 1 mod 5, and I claim that this holds true for all r. Now, it might, you might ask yourself, why on earth am I claiming this? Where is this coming from? Well, it will become apparent in just a second. But let me prove this first, and the way we're going to prove this is just by induction on r. So the base case when r equals 1 is just pretty straightforward. I'm not going to write it out. When r equals 1, we have x1 equals 2, so this is 2 squared, which is 4. 4 is, of course, minus 1 mod 5. So cool, that's the base case done. Now let's suppose it holds true for some r. So suppose xr squared equals minus 1, or it's congruent to minus 1 mod 5. Now let's look at xr plus 1. Well, by definition, xr plus 1 is simply the product of all the xi's plus 1, but that's in particular just xr times the product from i equals 1 to r minus 1 of xi plus 1, like so. But this guy here, this thing here, this product, is simply xr minus 1. So all in all, I can just replace this with xr minus 1, like so. Then if I just go ahead and square both sides, I'm going to get that xr plus 1 squared is equal to xr squared times xr minus 1 squared, plus 2 lots of xr, xr minus 1, and then plus 1, like so. And now we want to reduce this mod 5. Well, we know xr squared by assumption is just minus 1. So I can change this here to a minus 1. Or just a minus times this guy here. And now xr minus 1 all squared, if I just expand that out, I'm going to get an xr squared minus 2xr plus 1 
but uh, x r squared we know is minus 1, so the minus 1 and plus 1 will cancel, so I'm just left with a minus minus 2x r, which of course is just 2x r, like so. Then we've got 2x r here, and we've got a 2x r times minus 1, so that's going to cancel in just a second. But we've got this 2x r times x r, which is going to give us a 2x r squared, so this can all be replaced with just 2x r squared, and we know that x r squared is minus 1 by assumption, so this is minus 2 plus 1, and of course that's congruent to minus 1 mod 5, like so. So that proves that x r plus 1 squared is also congruent to minus 1, and hence we're done by induction. So that proves our claim, let me clean up the whiteboard, and we'll continue. Okay, so we just showed that x r squared is always going to be congruent to minus 1 mod 5. The next thing I want to do is look at the special case where r is an odd number, so 2k minus 1. So then we know that x1 all the way up to x2k minus 1 is just an a2k minus 1, because we just showed that x1 up to xr is always going to be an ar. Then I've written up a claim here, and that is for k at least 2, this kind of monstrosity here is an a2k plus 1. So this here is a 2k plus 1 tuple, and I claim that it's an a2k plus 1. Well, what is this uh, tuple? Well, the first 2k minus 1 entries are just the same as this guy here, so x1 will be 2, x2 will be, uh, you know, 2 times 2 plus 1, which is 3, and so on. So how we define the x size earlier, all the way up to x2k minus 1. Then my x, well, sorry, my 2k term will be the product from j equals 1 to 2k minus 1 of xj. So just when I multiply the first 2k minus 1 terms together, and then I'm going to add on alpha, and I'll get onto what alpha is in just a second, but it's a positive integer with a certain property. Uh, and my final entry, my 2k plus 1 entry, is going to be the product from j equals 1 to 2k of xj, so again, the product of these guys here, plus the product from j equals 1 to 2k minus 1 of xj squared plus 1, all divided by alpha. So alpha here, obviously, is, it must be a positive integer, but it also has to be it, you know, chosen in such a way such that this guy here, this fraction, is always an integer, because it, obviously for arbitrary alpha, because we're dividing through by alpha, this guy might not always be an integer, but we need to choose alpha in such a way, and the alpha we're going to choose is 5, and that kind of comes from the aid of this lemma, or the thing we just proved here. Because when alpha is 5, if we just have a look at this guy here, our numerator is the product from j equals 1 to 2k minus 1 of xj squared, but we know that that is just, all of them, if we look at the top mod 5, is just going to be minus 1. And we've got minus 1 multiplied by itself an odd number of times, so that's going to be minus 1 plus 1, which is going to give us 0 mod 5, so that means that the numerator is going to be, is always a multiple of 5, so if we choose alpha to be equal to 5, then we're doing a multiple of 5 divided by 5, so of course that's going to be an integer. So we're going to choose alpha equal to 5, like so. And in fact, you know, if we didn't have the restriction that alpha... You know, if we could, you know, just assume that any, uh, you know, some other alpha worked, you could actually go ahead and check that if, you, you know, if we left them as alphas, and this guy here was an integer, then you can just go ahead, that this guy here does in fact uh, satisfy the properties of a2k plus 1, but we found an alpha that works, so we're just going to use alpha equals 5. And yeah, as I say, if you just go ahead and, and check that this guy here satisfies the two properties to be an a2k plus 1, that is that it's non-decreasing. Non in fact, we can quickly check that now. This guy here is clearly non-decreasing. x1 is less than or equal to x2 and so on up to x2k plus 1 because this guy just comes from a2k minus 1. To see that this thing here is less than this thing here, again, we've got uh, an x2k minus 1 here hidden in our product. So it's x2k minus 1 multiplied by some positive integer plus 5. So of course, that thing there is going to be bigger than x2k minus 1. And then to see that this thing here is bigger than this thing here, that's, you know, the subtlety in us needing k to be at least 2. So that makes our product at the top here to be at least 25. Um, and then, yeah, of course, 25 over 5, or something that's bigger than 25 over 5, is of course going to be bigger than 5. So this is uh, certainly non-decreasing. And then you've just got to check the little uh, product property that, you know, if you do any uh, the product of all the elements, add on a particular element and divide through by that particular element squared, you're always going to get an integer. But I'll leave that to you. Um, so for now, I'm going to consider this proven. This guy here is an a2k plus 1. But what this actually tells us, if we just notice that this, this element in a2k plus 1 is not derived kind of the way we derive this inequality here. How we derive this inequality here, we take this guy here, multiply all the elements, and add 1 to get this guy here. But here we've got multiply all the elements and add 5. So this thing here, you know, if we, we know, for example, that a2k plus 1 is bigger than or equal to a2k minus 1 from this inequality here, 
but that didn't take into account for this tuple here. So we need to add one. So we get that a2k plus one is bigger than or equal to a2k minus one plus one. Because this guy here, this element, was not generated using the argument we had to derive that inequality. So we get this thing here holds true for k at least two. And now what we can do is combine this with the things we've proved so far and obtain a better lower bound for sk. Let me clean up the whiteboard and we'll do that. Okay, so we just showed that a2k plus 1 is bigger than or equal to a2k minus 1 plus 1, and that holds true for k being bigger than or equal to 2, but we can kind of continue that argument inductively and prove that the cardinality of a2k plus 1 must be bigger than or equal to the cardinality of a3 plus k minus 1. But we know that the cardinality of a3, well, we can be a little bit lazy and notice that, well, a1 is just a set with 2 in it, and so the cardinality of a1 is just 1, uh, and then a3 is, from this argument here, going to be bigger than a1, so a3 is going to be bigger than 1, so all in all, this is just bigger than or equal to k. But we could go ahead and work out what a3 was if we wanted to get a better uh, number here, but I'm too lazy, let's not do that. a2k plus 1 is bigger than or equal to k, but then that tells us that a2k, well, this thing here is going to be bigger than or equal to a2k minus 1 from this line here, but using this line here, well, for... Um, except with k replaced with k minus 1. So if we replace k with k minus 1 in this line, we get that this thing here is bigger than or equal to k minus 1. So now we know that the odd terms are bigger, so a2k plus 1 is bigger than or equal to k, and a2k is bigger than or equal to k minus 1. We can go ahead and now look at sk, and say that sk is equal to, well, I'm going to write it now, the sum from i equals 3 um, to k of ai plus 2, and then just add on the a2 case. And again, yeah, I'm going to bound this below. So this thing here is bigger than or equal to, well, a2 again is at least 1, plus the 2 there, so that's at least a 3 plus this guy here. And now we've just got to consider some cases where k is odd and k is even. So if k is odd, so say we've got 2k plus 1, and then we've got 2k plus 1 there, well then a2k plus 1 is going to be bigger than or equal to k, then a2k is going to be bigger than or equal to k minus 1. a2k minus 1 will be bigger than or equal to k minus 1, so that's a 2 there. Then we're going to get 2 lots of k minus 2, and so on, all the way down to, when you plug in i equals 3, you're going to get an uh, a3, which is also looking at this line here, that's going to correspond to k being equal to 2, so that's going to be bigger than or equal to 1, like so, so 2 lots of 1. Okay, so we get that s2k plus 1 is bigger than or equal to 3, plus k plus this guy here, which is just 3 plus k plus 2 lots of k minus 1 times k over 2. The 2 and 2 cancel, and this is just 3 plus k plus k times k minus 1. But the thing that we're interested in is we've got now a k times k minus 1. So we get that sk is growing, at, sorry, s2k plus 1 is going at least qu uh, quadratically. Now you can use a very similar thing here to get the s... 2k, this thing here, well, we can just be a little bit lazy, we know that this thing here is bigger than or equal to s 2k minus 1, and then we know that that thing there is going to be bigger than or equal to, just plugging in k minus 1 into that thing there, 3 plus k minus 1 plus k minus 1 times k minus 2, like so, I've, I've just scribbled it in it there, but the key thing to notice in the, is that in both those cases we're going to get something which is of order k squared, so both times we get the s k is approximately k squared, or we can put an alpha a squared, so it's of order k squared, sorry, s2k. So that, of course, means that sk is going to be well, half of that order k squared. So this thing here is going to be half, growing half the speed of a, you know, just a monic quadratic, but in particular, sk is growing quadratically, which is what we wanted to prove, because, of course, quadratic is bigger than linear. I hope that has all made sense. It's been a fun problem to solve. I hope everything you've been able to follow. If anything was unclear, let me know in the, in the comments down below and I'll try to clarify. But anyway, thank you for watching. Join me next week for the final set of problems for this competition. And yeah, until then, have a great day.